saith to Mark, Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. We grow not by holding on, but by letting go. Who do people say that I am, Jesus asks his disciples. And they convey to him all the guesses that they've heard, that Jesus might be one of the prophets of old who has returned. There were expectations that Elijah, who you'll remember, didn't die, but was taken up to heaven by a whirlwind on a chariot of fire, would return, and his return would mark the imminent coming of the Messiah. And so perhaps the people think Jesus is this Elijah, coming back to prepare the way for the Messiah. Or if he's not Elijah, maybe he's some prophet in the style of, say, John the Baptist. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, But who do you say that I am? And Peter remarkably and bravely says, You are the Messiah. And Jesus then tells the disciples to tell no one about his identity. It seems that Jesus is concerned, perhaps, that people will focus on his messiahship if they find out about it, and will focus on his messiahship as they expect for the messiah to be, instead of how he intends to be the messiah. Jesus explains to his disciples that he'll soon undergo great suffering and be rejected by the very people he's come to help and will be killed at their hands and rise again after three days. Well, this just doesn't jibe with the expectations for the Messiah. And the disciples even are challenged by this. And Peter steps up to speak once again and rebukes Jesus for having said that this would happen to him. This just doesn't fix. It just doesn't fit. And Jesus immediately recognizes that Peter and the others are putting their hopes and their expectations 
in front of God's plan. And he reacts quickly and strongly, saying to poor Peter, Get behind me, Satan. This was the same Peter who had just said, You're the Messiah. I mean, cut him some slack, Jesus. Perhaps then, in response to Peter's rebuke, Jesus calls together a crowd along with his disciples, and he tells them that if anyone truly wants to be his disciple, then he or she must take up their own cross and follow him. As it turns out, you see, our lives are not our own. They are a gift. We did nothing to merit our places on earth. We had no part in our own creation. And because being alive isn't something that we feel like we can take credit for or that we've earned in some way, perhaps then we might learn to hold that privilege a little more loosely than we think possible. Living and following in the way of our life giver isn't an opportunity for self-aggrandizement, but for serving as a source of light and life for another. And oftentimes the ways in which we do that involve our own sacrifice and pain. We aren't called to self-preservation, but to self-sacrifice. We grow not by holding on, but by letting go. The Presbyterian writer and thinker Frederick Buechner writes that the world says, mind your own business. And Jesus says, there is no such thing as your own business. The world says, follow the wisest course and be a success. And Jesus says, follow me and be crucified. The world says, drive carefully. The life you save may be your own. And Jesus says, whoever will save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The world says, law and order. And Jesus says, love. The world says, get. And Jesus says, give. In terms of the world's sanity, Jesus is crazy as a coot. And anybody who thinks he can follow him without being a little crazy too is laboring less under a cross than under a delusion. Jesus teaches that if anyone is to have any credibility when confessing him as the Messiah, then one cannot remain committed to one's own comfort, to avoiding the cross. Many times the world's plans come into conflict with God's plans, and the cross is that place of intersection. Our will moving in one direction intersects with God's moving in another. And to say the least, that intersection can most certainly for us be painful. Jesus teaches that in order for us to truly be his disciples, then we must be willing to bear the discomfort of those intersections and to allow ourselves to be realigned by the Holy Spirit in God's direction. Cross-bearing is a lifelong process, and the crosses we bear change from time to time throughout our lives. At some intersections, our paths may not be as firmly opposed to God's, and so the work of realigning us may not be that painful. But at other times, we will be firmly set in a path that is different from God's, and the task of turning us in the right direction will be painful. Jesus willingly went to his death upon the cross in the most perfect example of what it means to align, our, to align the world's will 
with God's. He took the world's hatred. He took the world's vitriol for the sake of the opportunity for God's love and grace to triumph. He gave himself up for the sake of the gift of life for us all. Being a disciple, then, means being willing to enter into those terribly uncomfortable crossings, those intersections between our will and God's, and to bear the pain of those places. Being a disciple means staying in those crossings until our will has been realigned with God's. And in those realigned moments, we show forth the love and life of God that dwells in us as a gift to be freely shared. We grow, you see, not by holding on, but by letting go. So may God's grace empower us to declare Jesus' messiahship to enter and bear those cross-shaped intersections that lie ahead and to give ourselves away for our own sake and for the sake of the world.